Today is June 5th, 2011. My name is Marty Dick. I'm interviewing George Woodward, who fought the Four Mile Canyon fire for six days in September 2010. Our first interview with him, ironically, had to be rescheduled because he was fighting another fire. This interview is being recorded for the Maria Rogers Oral History Program and being filmed by Don Dick. Well, George, what can you tell us about yourself? <laughs> about George Woodward? Um, I'm uh, 55 years old, <laughs> father of four. Um, been living in uh, Sunshine Canyon for five years. Um, Colorado for six, moved from Seattle uh, to here, and uh, enjoying the heck out of life. And how long have you been uh, on the fire department? I've been with Sunshine Fire for three years now. Mm -hmm. um, I was about two years in my current house and um, thought about joining. There was a, a fire that uh, happened shortly after I moved into the canyon and I felt pretty helpless not not being able to help and not n even knowing what to do um, so that was a good wake-up call uh, very shortly after getting here um, hook and crook it took about two years and I've been on now for three and you recently re uh, received some special training I did um, Last year, prior to the fire, to the big fire, uh, in the very beginning of the year, um, I uh, uh, took my medical, emergency medical training, and um, uh, I believe that was 15 weeks, uh, starting in January. And that ended up April, May-ish, somewhere in there, and they were offering, then there, uh, I became aware of a uh, wildland fire training uh, for fighting forest fires and jumped right out of the medical training into the uh, forest fire and um, completed that training in late May. That gave me a national certification so I could not only uh, uh, assist in fighting fire within my, my district, I could fight fire um, virtually anywhere in the nation. And you could hear about a fire when you were coming back from a camping trip. Can you tell us the sequence of events that happened? I, I can. Um, leading up to the, to the Four Mile Canyon fire, I was uh, um, on a weekend camping trip. I'd taken all of my gear, my firefighting gear out of the car uh, so I could get all my camping gear in and took off for the weekend. Thought, what, what did I need gear for? didn't even have a radio with me. I was, uh, went to Utah and Southern Colorado and I'm coming back um, and I get a phone call and, and part of the irony of the phone call from, from my uh, son who is also a firefighter and who also uh, has his uh, medical certification and his National Wildland Firefighting Certification called me within minutes of getting to a um, uh, a memorial trail near Grand Junction, uh, Colorado, that um, is uh, honors uh, 14 firefighters that were fighting a wildland fire uh, that perished. And uh, there's a memorial trail with markers. Um, I was probably 10 minutes from the exit to that trail when my son called and said, "Dad, you've got to get home right now. Uh, there's a there's a fire in the canyon, and it is big. It is really big, Dad. This is going to go on." They're saying. This is going to go on for seven days or more, and uh, so the only thought in my head, right? I mean, the, the, I said, Kyle, this is just, this is just so surreal. It's, it's, it's. I'm just coming up on the South Canyon Memorial Trail, and uh, he said, Well, don't hike it. Get home. <laughs> get, get back here. We <laughs> need that fire's over. And I said, Just, I said, Kyle, just please, please, please. Be careful, be safe, please don't become a memorial marker, and I'll see you when I get there. 
um, he said, you're not going to see me, Dad. I'm, st I'm at staging and I'm going into the fire in about 10 minutes. So uh, we'll catch up when we catch up. So that was, uh, that was my intro to the fire. And uh, at that time you were in uh, Glenwood Springs and you had uh, quite a trip home. It was Memorial Day, as luck would have it. And, um, it was Labor Day. Or I Labor Day, I mean, yeah. Labor Day. And uh, so everybody, you know, the, the, the highway was very, very crowded. And uh, I was able to sort of pick up my speed uh, out of Grand Junction and, okay, I'm rushing back. And uh, I get to sort of the Summit County ski areas where everybody vacations and the, and the traffic just clogged up. So I thought, well, what do I do? And I ended up not being unsafe, but being a little bit um, unorthodox. I threw on my flashers and uh, I didn't, you know, I was just driving my, my car and drove on the, on the shoulder uh, for about two hours. Um, I, instead of standing still, I was able to run about 20 miles an hour or so. Mm -hmm. At least I, that helped. And I eventually got back to Boulder. Um, prior to getting into Boulder, still way out in I-70 and a long ways from home, I saw the massive smoke clouds. And so I'm, I was able to uh, get some information by calling folks within the district and so I had some information as I got closer, but I could see the um, the clouds caused by the um, by the most intense fire you can have, and they're they're called um, pyrocumulus clouds. Very very ominous, and when you see those, you know you've got just a massive massive situation. Mm -hmm. um, got back into Boulder, took some pictures along the way, um, got to my. Uh, uh, the road that led up the canyon to my house that was of course blocked off by the sheriff's department and again I had no gear with me to fight the fire so I was I, I thought well do I do I run around to other stations and try to find gear or do I sweet talk or finagle my <laughs> way past this roadblock and at this point uh, wh whatever I did was was it, it convinced this gentleman and he had turned away numerous 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 people it was homeowners that were trying to get yeah. back up into the fire to get things out and, and to evacuate pets and, and frantic people and uh, somehow or other I came across as a firefighter let me up and I uh, did get up to the house. I'd made a, a little list of some things that I would want to take out of the house while I was grabbing my gear if I had time. I did uh, pack my car up, uh, got my gear, and uh, uh, at that point I was heading to the incident command to get uh, placed on the fire. And uh, there were uh, there was a lot of chaos. I got to incident command at um, the uh, Boulder Justice Center. Uh, lots of activity, but no assignment for George Woodward, and so a lot of frustration. That was about 5 o'clock. It wasn't until 10 o'clock that evening, and I'd been numerous times been told, go home, get some sleep, get fresh, we're going to put you on a, a crew in the morning. We're going to get a fresh crew in there in the morning. We don't know what's going on up there right now, we don't want trucks going in. and. It was about 9.30 when for, I lost count how many times, uh, they said, okay, we're gonna roll. And I had been going back and forth to apparatus for the entire time I was there trying to get uh, assigned to a truck to get an engine crew to take me. <laughs> and uh, which would, would have been of no value if they wouldn't have sent us in. <laughs> I got an engine crew to take me at about nine o'clock and at 9.30, they said, go home, we're not putting anybody in. None of us left. Uh, we we're all persistent, and at 10 o'clock, they, they cleared us to go in to do initial assessment uh, up into Sunshine Canyon. They didn't have good, any good knowledge of what was happening. Our job was to go up and, uh, and, uh, and make assessments. Uh, my, the first thing I, I uh, sort of remember in rolling in the trucks was leaving the Justice Center we were all so anxious to go, it didn't dawn on me that no one was familiar with the area. We didn't even know to turn left or right. So we, uh, we I said, Sunshine Canyon is to the right. And all of a sudden I became sort of the, the guide 
um, and uh, got the trucks going over to uh, to Sunshine Canyon, and we ended up uh, uh, rolling up the canyon. Very, very thick smoke. I lived here for five years and or four years, over four years at the time, and nothing looked familiar to me. So uh, I could only imagine how eerie it was for the rest of the guys who were from different towns, different places that had never been in the canyon. Um, and that, um, the next sort of major event was coming up the canyon and we had about somewhere between a dozen and a dozen and a half apparatus. So it was, it was quite a parade. Would have done any 4th of July proud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you were leading this parade. Well, I was in the second truck behind. The first truck that I had finagled my way onto uh, turned out to be the truck that the uh, division commander wanted to ride in. So he asked if uh, if he could trade seats with me. So all of a sudden, I I was like big guy. I was uh, already already doing favors for the division commander and. Uh, um, so yeah, I was I was essentially lead. They were in front of us, but we we're in radio communication to tell them left and right and where they were in the canyon. We got up to about the four and a half mile marker is where we stopped, where the the commander stopped all of the uh, the apparatus, uh, and we and everyone uh, uh, deployed out for a briefing. And our briefing was. Um, Essentially, it was, a, again, a reminder of all of the safety situations to watch out for, and then we were all given assignments. One truck was assigned to um, take a, a house that was um, uh, partially on fire that had been being worked by another crew that was relieved. They went home for the night. That was uh, 10, 10, 30-ish. Um, so we assigned an engine to that, and then my engine was assigned to do triage, which is... We were, we were assigned an area with addresses to walk down driveways to see if there were houses uh, in there. If there was a house at the end of the driveway, our job was to, as quickly as possible, clean um, combustible materials away from the house. So anything that would burn, whether it's you know wood or furniture or anything, grasses, clear it out away, check the house for open windows, uh, and just prep it, just prep it. Um, we did four houses fairly quickly. Uh, no, I take that back. The first four houses weren't fairly quickly. We, it was very surreal. Almost no, vis no visibility. You couldn't tell if there was a house there until you were upon it. And this is because of thick smoke. There was fire that lit up the area. There was fire everywhere. It was, it was just strange, but it was late at night. This is now 11-ish, 11.30-ish. The, the winds had been incredibly, incredibly fierce all day, but now they were calm. So it was just this eerie, eerie feeling of you can't really see, but you've got fire burning everywhere. It's mostly on the ground, sometimes in the trees. When a tree goes up, it torches and you get a little bit better visibility, but otherwise, otherwise you just have fire everywhere and you're kind of walking through it and around it trying to, and these driveways were great because they weren't burning, so we went down <laughs> those. And we, we did, so we checked these houses and then we moved and I remember moving on to the fourth house. We had taken copious notes, my, my engine boss did, and, uh, and so we, we go to the fourth house and we're walking up and some of the guys are saying, it's all, uh, uh, be careful, it's very, very slippery. And they said, this place has been painted. And uh, I didn't even know, I did at the time, I didn't know what that meant. And that whole area had been slurry bond uh, to uh, stop the fire. Uh, so that kind of worked that area. Um, how, it, how, does this, how, how does slurry um, react on the ground and in houses and on trees? Well, it's a, it's a retardant. Um, I don't know that it works very good on flame itself, but um, they lay it down ahead of the fire and, uh, and it reduces the combustibility of the, of the forest and, and houses and any, any, any burnable materials. So when the fire gets there, it doesn't want to burn too much after mm -hmm. that. It doesn't want to uh, ignite mm -hmm. the, uh, the items that have been slurried. 
Um, it's an, the orange stuff that you you know you see in all of the pictures. But this was uh, very very dark, uh, v extremely poor visibility from the smoke, um, and so we walked up that driveway. And they were talking about, uh, oh, look at the house, look at the house. It's uh, it's all painted, and I'm trying to process what all of this is. This is my first big fire. I know what slurry is. I'd been trained. I'd been on some small fires, but there was nothing that I could ever think of that could have prepared me for what I went into. This was the largest, the most devastating fire in the, the history of the state of Colorado. We, no stranger. Colorado is not a stranger to fires. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, wow, my first real one is the biggest one in history or the most devastating one from a, from a damage standpoint. And so we point, to, we point our, our headlamps up at this house and it's a lighter colored house and it was all this orange and dripping, just dripping down. And I'm, this must have been the fifth or the sixth or the 20th weird thing that I had seen <laughs> already so far already and we hadn't barely gotten into the fire so we we did that uh, triage that house that house had fire creeping right up to it that house would have been gone 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 it was still fire was creeping up to it but would hit that slurry and mm -hmm. uh, and was laying down so we pulled I did we did pull some fire away from that house and then we moved on to the next and the next house we got to, was down a very, very, very long and narrow driveway. <clears throat> um, and the, our engine, my engine boss determined right away, I mean, before we were probably halfway down this extremely long driveway, this was not a safe situation to get a truck in here. Um, so as with the previous houses, we were marking them, is this a house we can get a truck in safely, get a crew in safely? Is, if fire uh, makes it here, do we send somebody in to fight it? This fifth or sixth house was our first house where he said, we're crossing this one off. This is a red. Mark this one red. Uh, beautiful home, but just couldn't, you just couldn't get a crew in safely. There were a lot of trees around the house close up. It wasn't going to be a very defensible home and it wasn't going to be a safe home to fight. Very, very strange for me to process that at this point. You, we're mm -hmm. firefighters. You don't, you go in there, you, I mean, you, you, you make every effort. It still hadn't sunk in the magnitude of this fire. I wasn't aware that hundred, you know, over a hundred homes were already vaporized to nothing. So I was like, okay, that's a red one. I, I know this from training. That's crossing, cross him off and move on. This driver was so long that in order to get to the next house, this was the first time we left pavement or asphalt, and we went cross country right through the fire. I thought, okay, these guys know what they're doing. <laughs> this is pretty weird. We just went right into the woods, and we were just part of the fire. And it was not absolutely everywhere, and it was low, and it had very, very, it was very well behaved fire. <laughs> it had calmed down. And it wasn't raging. Uh, you know, again, some trees would go up. We had propane tanks that had um, uh, released and were burning uh, as a, like a torch. But they were just torching up in the air, and you just got used to it. There's a there's a LP tank torching over there. It's like, oh, on any other night, you'd be calling for reinforcements, mm -hmm. but you just walked past it. That's when we got to the houses that were vaporized. Those were the first ones, and we had five of them, I think, four or five. And they were just nothing, four of them, nothing there, just powder. Mm -hmm. um, and everything around them, powder. Uh, we've, uh, again, it's dark, bad visibility. We found um, um, somebody came across what they thought was a boat. And they mm -hmm. said, oh, what's this? It's, it's strange shape and, and there was a, a melted trailer and a melted boat and so a lot of things like that where you're just processing you're just kind of going boy i never seen anything like that and you just move on and you move on with your assignment checking houses writing down what ones are there what ones aren't which ones are savable and and all the all the time doing what you can to make them more defensible and that was 
sort of the at that point we went back to um, we went back a, to our staging a, a st uh, mm -hmm. interruption here um, when you did enter standing houses to um, check them out what were you looking for and how did you go in them well that was strange the um, we got to I think it's the first second third house somewhere in there in my and they, it had windows open on the second floor and my engine boss this whole place is on fire it's everywhere and he took off his boots <laughs> he took off his boots I mean these boots are 10 <laughs> inches high and they lace up it's like granny boots and and he took them all off and went upstairs and he wouldn't go in without a second firefighter with him he's not going to enter that house it's that's just not what you do and you know he it's accountability and so they both took their shoes off and I was like I don't know if it's going to get any stranger than this. <laughs> <laughs> Little did you know. There's, oh, and it kept getting stranger every hour and every day after that. But they went up, they, they, they closed those windows, and they, and they were so, so respectful of people's property. So, And then on we went. We went uh, back to our trucks. Um, other trucks had been redeployed to different areas along Sunshine, and it appeared as though most of them came back and we debriefed. Um, we reported in everything that we had found, um, and then we got a new assignment. We were assigned to uh, move from there, which um, was about the four and a half mile mark, and we were uh, deployed up to up Sunshine Canyon to County Road 83, where we were assigned to Whispering Pines, um, a road off of County Road 83. Sunshine, to this point, was still. Uh, is still paved uh, up to that point and at County Road 83 it turns to dirt and County Road 83 is also a dirt dirt surface gravel surface um, we went down 83 to Whispering Pines and that was another uh, I, I sort of surreal I as we moved up to our new assignment it would be about a couple, three miles, maybe, total. I don't remember seeing a single apparatus. Uh, visibility was terrible. We could have gone by trucks. Um, I could see things, but then I couldn't see things. So I just don't remember ever seeing any apparatus. We had all shut our, our emergency lights off because they were uh, destroying our visibility in this, in this uh, hazy, smoky fog. Um, it just, we just, when we got back in the truck uh, that time, it just seemed like we were on our own. We were all by ourselves. It was okay. I've got, there's three other guys in this truck. Ironically, the three guys, I'd said I was 55. I think I might have been 54 at the time. Studly 54. And the three guys were this within six months of the ages of all three of my sons. So it was, it was it was kind of my three boys and me mm -hmm. all by ourselves. We headed in. We get to Down County Road 83, and I was fairly familiar with 83. I'd been out of the department for a while. And I took a lot of pride in being able to brief my engine crew and the division commander on sunshine, on the, the, the train, the topology, on safety issues, on escape routes, uh, up to this point, I was doing pretty good, and I was feeling very good about it. And they were incredibly appreciative. They, they, they were like, "We don't care that this is your first major fire. <laughs> You've got local knowledge. You are a rock star to us." Mm -hmm. And so I was like, "Okay," uh, until we got to Whispering Pines, and I'd never gone down that. I, t I, I, I asked the. Uh, the uh, engineer driving our uh, our truck, I asked him to stop, and I said, "Guys, I've never been down this road. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I probably apologized three, four times, and it was very narrow road. It was difficult to get our truck turned into it in the first place, and now we've gone from paved road to a very wide gravel road to an incredibly narrow." mountain alley 
<laughs> I mean, a trail that was terrible. I'm looking ahead and there are burning trees on both sides and I'm almost certain our truck is going to have to scrape to go through. And I said, guys, this is a dead end. There's no escape route. I believe there's, um, there is a way to get from the end of this road, this uh, uh, Whispering Pines, uh, uh, like a trail, a four-wheel drive trail, that, that, but it's, I'm sure it's gated, locked. I don't have the combo. I went from feeling very, very valuable to my team to just letting, I just, I couldn't have been more disappointed in what I didn't know. I briefed them on that. They said, looks okay to us, let's roll. <laughs> and all three of them acknowledged it. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Whoa. But they had fought many, many fires. I had an engine boss that was a full-time uh, captain at, uh, in the town of Greeley who ran their wildland uh, firefighting uh uh, organization. So I had a tremendous amount of confidence, even if he was the age of my <laughs> oldest son, who was a pretty smart guy by himself too. But so, and then, uh, and then my engineer, um, uh, had fought numerous fires. Uh, both the engineer and my other, my other engine crew had been on uh, Cal fire or the California state of California fire crews get a lot of experience there. And they had obviously fought a number of fires in Colorado. So poof, into, into uh, Whispering Pines we go. And it is just that there's fire everywhere. There's fire. Now we're, we've got a steep drop off to the right and we've got a, a significant incline to our left. And we're on this very narrow road with a fairly large truck. How big was your truck? Our truck was a type four. So if you think of the brush trucks as being very, very large pickup trucks. They're type sixes, I believe. And then this type four would be two, three times the size of a very large uh, uh, pickup truck. So I would say, think of your, your typical city fire truck, about halfway between half the size of that two, three times the size of a, of a brush truck. And so, and, it's, and it was a beautiful truck. I, I, was, I was so lucky to get on this truck and to get it with this crew. I'm, I'm a sunshine uh, f uh, firefighter. Uh, there were no sunshine firefighters at staging. They had all been working the fire. I was in, mm -hmm. you know, half a state away or <laughs> more than half a state right. away. So they were had all been working. I just wanted to get in. And so I got this crew and into Whispering Pines we went. And uh, um, I was like, uh, we went up one of the first driveways. I, I think it was uphill to the left. And we went from a really crappy mountain road to a really, really, really crappier <laughs> driveway. <laughs> and this thing, and this the fella driving up he went no hesitation I mean these guys were very concerned about safety but we had fire everywhere and now we're even in a what? smaller area we get up there's a house there we do triage he turns that truck around like it's on a turnstile and out we went uh, back to the next house and we started doing triage um, all up and down so at this point we pulled out of that terribly narrow driveway. Um, I was extremely impressed. I, I was, I, I don't know if impressed is the right word, but the engineer got that, that huge truck turned around in absolutely no space at all. So I, that has a lasting memory. We went down <clears throat> and as we're for going further into um, Whispering Pines, I had thought about it earlier, but it, it was no more vivid and real than at this point the the 18 watch out events or 18 watch out situations that we're trained on as firefighters. These are all safety issues, and you can't go into a fire without <clears throat> experiencing a number of these of these safety issues. But the the key being, you know, how many you know the the more you experience, uh, the more heightened sense of awareness uh, that you have, and and you. You're trained that 
um, as you, as you get a, a a bunch of them, you know, you have to start making decisions uh, differently about you know the, the 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 situation that you're into. So these help you kind of kind of uh, uh, gauge where you're at in a in a in a fire as far as how bad is this and and how many how many critical things are happening and I'm going on Misty Vale uh, or Whispering Pines and I'm thinking there's 18 of them I'm trying to remember what they all are but every one that I can remember is already happening we're already experiencing it so it was a, a very very uh intense situation as I had mentioned earlier we had very significant terrain so we had this very very steep to the right uh, in in many places and very steep to the left so as fire you know fire likes to run up uh, these this steep terrain and of course it had in this area uh, it had run up there uh, at least once perhaps twice during the day before we got there now it's uh, you know it's the middle of the night it's Two in the morning, three in the morning. Um, as I'd mentioned, the winds are calm and, and the fire behavior was 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 down. But we had trees burning. We had ground fire absolutely everywhere. We pull out of here and and we go f and we and we go further in, which is strange. But again, I've got three three highly experienced uh, engine crew with me and and uh, and, and I, I, what? Excuse me. Which mm -hmm. of the uh, 18 uh, issues, watch out issues, were most strongly in your mind at that time? Well, escape route, for sure. Um, do we, you know, do we have an escape route? Um, I'm trying to think of the, um, the most important. Uh, we had communications, so mm -hmm. I wasn't too worried about that. Mm -hmm. um, but it seemed like, like we were experiencing pretty much all the rest. <laughs> Um, it was escape route for me, I think more than anything, you know, where's the safety zone and what is the route to that safety zone? Well, the safety zone is the road behind us and we have to get this thing, this apparatus turned around and, and we're going further in and, um, and so the route to the safety zone was long and 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 uh so this we wouldn't have been in there if the fire behavior hadn't been uh fairly calm i mean mm -hmm. as i mentioned there's fire everywhere but it wasn't uh moving rapidly and it wasn't erratic it was predictable and it was well behaved fire <laughs> but again it's forest fire it's absolutely every we're going down this road further and we get to the end uh there's a couple of ends and it splits and I mean this is mountain ter mountain terrain and, and mountain houses so it sort of takes a turn we go up another way we go further up and I'm and I'm getting more you know more and more conscious of the fact that we're very far in on this very very narrow road um, but we're we're triaging houses we're, we're documenting what we've what we find now at this point we're not writing anything down anymore we had abandoned that there was so much fire everywhere we were just doing radio reports here's where we're at this is what we're seeing and then 15 minutes later as we're walking through and checking houses and doing driveways and and uh, you know finding vaporized homes uh, we're, we're, we're sort of reporting in periodically. So where we started this meticulous documentation, we'd, we'd kind of abandoned that and we were, we were working. We we're working fast. On the vaporized homes, uh, that's kind of an interesting point because, you know, prior to this, uh, my exposure to fire was more uh, typical city fire. And, and you see on the 10 o'clock news, this big blazing house. And we had certainly a lot of that on the news uh, for, uh, for, for the Four Mile Canyon fire. But at this point, when the fire raced through, we're not finding houses that are, are burning. We're finding houses that are either standing with fire creeping toward them, very erratic. Uh, some of this house is there the next house is completely gone so it's not um, this burned out shell of a house you see on the news and the windows broken and all of this burned timber and you know some debris laying out in the yard that firefighters had brought out to get things out it wasn't that at all if that house was burned it was powder 
with just a mm -hmm. foundation and nothing else. Maybe some debris in the yard, but not too much there. Clean. So in many cases, you couldn't really tell there was even a yard or anything mm -hmm. ever existed. And that's where it hit me that th these are, this is people. I was so intense about, oh, I got to get on the fire and oh, I got to contribute and oh, I got to, you know, do what I was trained to do. And, and, you know, this is my, my community and I got to be in there. And, and, you know, you see that and then you go, oh my God, this is somebody who lost absolutely everything. There's a family. There's nothing. There's not anything. It's not like the news at all. Poof, it's gone. So, um, so at this point, we hadn't seen in, in golf homes. So we go up to the end, absolute dead end. Uh, I'm out of the, we're out of the truck. We finished the triage and the, the engine boss assigns two guys to, to turn the truck around while he and I walk down, uh, uh, back down the road, checking driveways as we go. Again, it's so thick smoke and, and it's, it's hard to describe because there's fire absolutely everywhere. Everything is burning. It's burning calmly. Uh, it's not blowing away, but you can't see. And so I'm walking with this engine boss and I'm talking to him. Sometimes I'm talking, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I can see him. While I'm talking to him, I can't see him. He's five feet away, maybe six. I don't turn my head and point my eyes directly at him because I don't want to hit him with my the, the, the beam of my, my uh, headlamp and uh, ruin his night vision, although that happens a lot. Uh, they just sort of come into view. I remember walking with four guys. Sometimes they're there. Sometimes it's one. Sometimes it's three. And we're walking together. So it's very, very strange. We get down. The two two of us get down to this driveway and we go in. And it was another one of these very, very strange situations where just eerie, eerie, eerie. There's a, a beautiful white travel trailer. Uh, just like the one I used to have and I noticed it right away and it it looked like it was just polished It was beautiful pristine is what it what it, it, it the, the way I remember it and ten feet right in front of it is a completely burned out shell of the SUV that I'm sure towed it It was sitting per perpendicular. It wasn't hooked up, but this SUV and and, and it was kind of sort of gallows humor the the SUV was a burned out shell and it was a Chevrolet Blazer and Blazer. I ended up making a joke. Some guy says, "Wasn't that a was that a Bronco or was that a Blazer? Was that a Ford something or was that a Blazer?" I said, "Hey, look, man, everything up here is a Blazer now." Mm -hmm. But it was it was a it was a Blazer, completely burned to nothing, down on the ground, the tires no nothing, and here's this beautiful pristine trailer. We go further in, my engine boss. We're looking at this, and he goes, well, do you know where the house is in here? I don't know this. And he says, well, I, I walked forward, and there was still a lot of fire, but I didn't know where the house was. It, it was a different layout. I couldn't tell anything, and I came across this big wooden swing set. And there's, it's a wooden timbered, big, thick timbered thing, and it's fine. The trailer was fine. The blazer was gone. And I remember talking with my engine boss, and he's going, I think the house is here. We couldn't tell. So we didn't have a defined foundation. I don't know if it was a slab house or what. We just couldn't be absolutely certain. But we went and walked around the area. There was no house. And there was every indication that there should have been a house there. Mm. We just couldn't find it. Very, very strange. We walked on from there. Uh, we got down to, you know, sort of this barn and horse area. I thought, oh, that was very strange. And we find this, uh, um, again, it's the engine boss and I walking and the truck is uh, further up. We're about what would be the equivalent of a city block away. We come across this garage, cabin, mother-in-law place, um, beautiful horse trailer in front of it um, and fire creeping right up the side of it. And, uh, and uh, my engine boss and I run over and we're pulling fire away from it. He he gets on the radio. I remember this very distinctly. He says, "Get the truck down here. We've got about a minute to save this place." In 60 seconds, it's like, "Holy cow!" So I'm just chopping like crazy, and 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 
the fire had gotten into the wall, so we're, we're with our, our uh, Pulaski's, our axes, we're, we're busting out wall and pulling fire off of this house and pulling the fire away. There was debris and wood and things that were that had creeped up. He gets the engine down, and uh, or the the engineer and the and the other crew member got the engine down. They had a little trouble getting the pump going. Uh, at this point, I think it was the boss yelled out. 15 seconds, go, no, go, 15 or 30. And it was like, we've got 30 seconds and we're going to walk. We're just going to walk away or we're going to stay and get this <laughs> this bugger put out. We worked, we made a huge impact and, uh, and off we went. Uh, we got it out and, well, I'm sorry, we didn't have it completely out. It was really funny. We had to get inside this building to really get it completely out. So um, we went over to the door. It was locked. I said, can I take the door out? And he goes, you know, <laughs> you can take that. If you can take that door out with minimal damage, he says, go for it. Otherwise, no. And I'm thinking if we don't get the door down, the house is going to burn to the ground. We've, it's going to be vaporized. This is the same guy who took his shoes off. He's done this over and over. I'm like, okay. And I tried my darndest. And I, I, every hit hit square with my axe, hit, uh, the butt of my axe hit square on the doorknob. I was feeling so good. And finally the doorknob just punched right through. And there was almost no damage to the door. We got in, we did our business. Uh, we spent a fair bit of time save the structure and we're walking down to the next one he goes woodward sweet job on that door <laughs> he says there's like twenty dollars damage you are and i'm like this is just so funny it's just so different so weird we get down to another house and there's fire all over it fire creeping up to it and uh and um i get deployed past that house I fight fire on a cabin or small home down below, save it, felt really good. So this is now two saves in half hour, 40 minutes, uh, feeling good, looking good. We get a call on the radio, get back up here. The house that we had passed, they were starting to lose it. Uh, they needed more help up there and they needed, uh, they needed uh, uh, more firefighters the engine was up there so I remember we we no no the engine wasn't up there we had to get it turned around and get back up there to this point the only the only structure we had used any water on whatsoever was the uh, the sort of mother-in-law cabin this cabin down below uh, small house saved we saved that one without mm -hmm. any water mm -hmm. a lot of work dragging fire away patting it out everything that you do in a forest uh, to get fire out without water we get up to this house and now we've got trucks we're dragging hose and uh my engine boss this is one of the more surreal situations he goes in the the front door is wide open there's a car with uh doors open so there was a lot of sort of indicators that there was perhaps somebody still here um you can never be sure we had windows open upstairs and we had a front door open so he went in I don't think he took his boots off this time. This was a strange situation. And he did get another another firefighter to go in with him. And they, I don't recall if they shut the windows on the first floor and they went up and they're yelling, is anybody here, is anybody here? And they come across the bedroom upstairs and there's this fella dr drunk, in intoxicated, uh, <laughs> in the bed, face down. They start shaking him. Uh, and he gets up, stands up, he's completely butt naked. I mean, so if it hadn't been strange enough, now this is four in the morning, five in the morning, you know, fire, strange stuff. It couldn't get any crazier. Bare naked, intoxicated, rowdy guy. Okay, this is top in the list. <laughs> this guy's like, Get away. There's, I've been here all day. There's, you know, my house isn't going to burn. You guys, blah, 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 blah. You're just getting here now. You don't know nothing. And, 
and uh, the, my engine boss can't think of anything to do but bring him over to the window so he can look out and see that there is fire absolutely everywhere. So when the guy sees this, he's like, oh my God, we're all going to die. There's fire everywhere. <laughs> and so he had to negotiate. My, my, uh, our, our engine boss negotiated with this, with this intoxicated, bare naked guy. <laughs> One, put clothes on. Two, you got to get downstairs. You got to stand outside. You sit on on the the steps away from the house, or this house is going to burn. I can't fight the fire while I'm trying to negotiate with you. If you will get some clothes on and get downstairs, um, if you know, and you, they're going to stay with this guy until it, that happens. Um, if you don't do that, your house is going to burn. If you do do that, I will do everything I can to save your house. Guy cooperates. Get some clothes on. Goes downstairs, asks, Can I have my bottle of wine? And the engine boss, my boss says, Yes, you can have it if you sit there. <laughs> and the guy does it. This is where I walk up. I'm dragging hose. <laughs> and I've got a guy who's partially dressed, sucking on a bottle of wine on a, on a set of stone stairs. And I'm like, Wow. <laughs> and I go right by him. And I'm back in and, and, I'm, and I'm hitting this fire. And at this point now, there's. 12, 14 firefighters, maybe more, number of engines fighting this fire. We get it all knocked down. We order a uh, sheriff deputy up. Uh, he didn't like coming up, but he comes up, takes this fellow away, and, and um, we knock down that. Absolutely another safe, big, giant, beautiful house. Bingo, you know, it doesn't get any better score for our team. <laughs> At this point, we uh, head back to, it's around 7.38 in the morning, we head back to uh, the uh, staging area at Ball Mountain, and we um, uh, debrief um, what took place. We brief our replacement crew that are all there. and uh, So they were there waiting for us to come in, give them the brief, and... and uh, um, uh, there were other commanders and, you know, we would just do our little part and, and change shifts. That's when my crew said, um, you know, Woodward, would you mind uh, pulling a double and working another uh, 12 hours? So we had started at 10. I got the incident command around 5, got on the fire at 10. It's 8 in the morning the next day now on Tuesday. and. Uh, I'm still completely amped up. They said, can you pull another 12-hour shift? I don't know if they said 12, but they said a shift. <laughs> I said, yes. And uh, off we went. We got our debrief and we got reassigned and back to, oh, now to Misty Vale instead of Whispering Pines. And uh, that meant a lot to me because my son lives, lived on uh, Misty Vale. Mm -hmm. um, very, very short street, down 83. Uh, again, gravel, and we uh, fought fire down there, and did triage, and did saves, and um, all the time we didn't go to my son's house. It was back in an area that we hadn't gotten to yet, and I I had passed it numerous times, but because of visibility, couldn't see if there was a house there or not. So that was kind of weighing on my mind this whole time. It turned out a few couple of days later. Um, there was a lull and I was able to go down with another uh, firefighter and my son's house wasn't there. Took some pictures just to... So we head down uh, Misty Vale. This is, uh, I think, our second time down. But um, as we're going down, we get, we get to the end and there's significant fire coming up a ridge. And it, it was uh, uh, coming right up on a on a uh, garage, or a, a big garage, a lot of wood stacked around, and it had engulfed uh, big piles of cut wood. So very, very hot, very intense fire. Uh, and this is daytime. Uh, we've got winds, and we have erratic fire behavior. And it, uh, we get in there, and if we get in fast enough, we can save this garage, and more importantly, save the two houses that are, uh, that are uh, right very close to it. So we got our engine turned around. Um, I was fortunate enough to be on nozzle, so running right into the fire. I'm like, this is great. Uh, big fire, huge flames, hot. I remember going, wow, this is really hot. 
I mean, really hot. Um, I had been in fire for, I don't know, 14, 16, 15, 16, 17 hours, but I hadn't been in huge flames. So I'm knocking this down. My job was to get enough of the flame knocked down for the next guy with a hose to get in and get to the houses, get past the garage. So I was hell-bent on making sure that there was a path for this fella. So hot didn't bother me, but it did register. It registered. <laughs> and we worked on those houses and kept them cool and kept them foamed. Uh, one kind of I ended up calling the ice cream house because we had just literally made that house ice cream. <laughs> it was pretty cool. We saved both of them. And we got to uh, be right next to massive, huge flames, which was pretty cool as well. Uh, because that's what we're trained to do and and so you're in this stuff and so it's weird the things that you sort of like uh, so that was good because we had massive flame and saved two houses um, the next thing we got called into was this uh, mine shaft fire and, and sunshine has uh, old mining shafts absolutely everywhere and uh, some are small and some are big and some go a long ways and some don't this one had um, tremendous amount of timbers, huge, maybe, uh, I don't know, two foot square, like massive timbers. And this was for, you know, heavy, you know, hoists and equipment and all of this stuff. Well, we came around County Road 83 and we went down Mistyville or uh, uh, Whispering Pines and around and essentially looped back around so that this mine shaft that we got to, and it was in big, big, big flames, <clears throat> was on a hill, went into the side of the hill, and not very far in, up above it was the County Road 83. And so we were assigned to put this out so that the fire didn't progress in the mine shaft, compromising all of the timbers and, and causing County Road 83 to collapse. So that's a strange assignment when you get called to a fire to keep a road from collapsing. So. <laughs> Very, very strange stuff. And there were a lot of things that was a big fire. And, and again, I got uh, a lot of time on the nozzle for a firefighter. That's kind of fun. And then for a wildland firefighter, you don't get a lot of uh, uh, nozzle time because usually the only, only water you have with you is what you, there's no hydrants. <laughs> so, you know, you have 880 gallons. It sounds like on, you know, it sounds like a lot on your truck that, that you can knock out that in minutes and it's all gone. So um, we had a, a tanker come in, uh, give us more water. We use foam. Uh, we can get a lot more firefighting. Uh, we use a lot less water when we use foam and so we, we fought that fire. That was really fun too because not only was it big flame, but we had other uh, engine crews come and they were fighting from the top, blowing oh, down huh. uh, on us and we were on the bottom. Uh, blowing in we were lead on the fire uh, mm -hmm. so that was our incident and so we had mm -hmm. kind of command of the situation mm -hmm. so that was nice we had two three other uh, uh, crews and and uh, and we saved a road very strange mm -hmm. so there were numerous sort of highlights and low lights <laughs> and as the days went on um, I remember one specific uh, evening, there was um, uh, weather predicted to come up, a uh, red flag warning, high winds, low humidity, all that firefighting jargon stuff. Uh, but a bad situation. Weather was going to create uh, nasty fire behavior and it was forecasted to come at whatever time. And we were positioned uh, uh, in an area specifically waiting for that to happen. And sure enough, it did. Winds came up. We went from calm fire behavior to um, the sun had gone down. Actually, in, at this point, it was the winds came up as we were losing the last of our light. And I remember looking out at the side of the hills, and fire just started coming up. I mean, it was uh, embers and logs and things that had burned previously, and the wind now flam put them into flames. But the most significant one was uh, an area way above us on very steep terrain, and it just lit up. And it was uh, not open fire, but this like embers, massive ember storm. And so off we went, crew donned our 
our headlamps and into the woods we went steep terrain you know uh not knowing if we're going to fall in mine shafts stepping in uh these holes that used to be stumps that are burned out no longer there and you drop a foot in you know you go down two feet and you, know, you pull yourself out of that and you climb up and we get up there to the top and we came over this ridge and it was eerie and beautiful uh and strange the wind had fanned this field of grass uh into what looked like millions of fireflies and it was i was i was pretty concerned about it because i thought there's all of this um burning material all these embers uh but um our engine boss wasn't too concerned he he assessed the situation and determined that these embers were burning out as before they actually touched anything but there were millions of them and it was it was uh uh like i don't know fireflies it was beautiful and <laughs> and eerie we turned around and walked back down um that got us kind of to the end of the sort of the fire uh, i deep you know demobilized i uh kind of had a chance to sort of start thinking about what had happened over the last six days and uh you know i'd seen a lot uh, experienced a lot uh from you know command and structure and fire and protocol and watchouts and and everything my son had made it through he had a a great experience saved a bunch of houses that was wonderful i felt really good i felt really a more a part of the community after that mm. than i had ever felt and i love where i live and i love my community but i think everybody went through that just the trauma of it but for me i got a chance to work on people's houses and make an make an impact have an impact and it was great it was a wonderful experience